2002, I posted ads in theaters and acting schools in Los Angeles. And um, the ads were an open call for an actress um, who was blonde and in her mid-30s, who was medium height and medium weight. And um, from the many responses I got, um, this was the headshot of the girl I chose. And um, this is a work called Unknown. I photographed the actress in and around my house. And um, here she is playing um, my guitar in my living room. Um, she's petting my cat. <laughs> she's sitting outside. Uh, she's sitting on my bed. And these are, are very large scale pastel drawings. Um, Unknown um, was a project I did in direct response to a work I had just completed um, called Amy Adler Photographs Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and in this piece I invited Leonardo DiCaprio to my apartment and uh, photographed him. Um, it took a year to arrange the meeting, but he showed up and um, we had an intimate conversation um, while I photographed him by the light of my bedroom window. It's true. <laughs> it happened. Um, I prepared for the photo shoot by asking friends of mine um, to stand in that same position by the window. So it was really intense to suddenly see this actor through the same lens. And I made life-size drawings of the photographs and then I destroyed the original photographs. Um, and then once the drawings were destroyed, were made, I photographed them and destroyed the original drawings. Um, I was trying to understand um, what life drawing was, um, so this piece was an attempt to stand face to face with someone that I would only ever be able to see through film. Um, I'm including this here because the same year that I photographed Leonardo DiCaprio, I collaborated with uh, recording artist Joni Mitchell. And this project was called Amy Adler Curates Joni Mitchell. And um, as you probably all know, Joni Mitchell is a painter as well as a singer. And, um, but her paintings really only exist in the context of her music um, on her record covers and her CD liners. So I was curious to see what would happen if I removed the paintings from the music which I saw as working as a kind of chaperone or, um, or bodyguard. Um, so with her consent, I borrowed a dozen of her paintings and showed them um, in an art gallery in Los Angeles. Um, and the title of this album and this painting, which was painted by Joni Mitchell, uh, was Both Sides Now. And it was this painting was in my show um, just weeks before it appeared um, on the cover of her record. Um, in this older piece, it's called Bop, um, I sent in a drawing to the P.S. I Love You section of B Bop magazine. And um, it's where lovesick teeny boppers send in their drawings of their beloved idols. <coughs> and um, they publish it, which was... <laughs> And, um, and I was not a teeny bopper. I mean, I was 25 years old. And it was among the highlights of my life. But I realized through the drawing um, that I could be a ventriloquist or a spy, an infiltrator or an imposter. And so here I'm a teenager. Here I'm a stranger, um, a man approaching a 13-year-old girl on the beach. But I'm also the girl, as these pictures were taken of me when I was 13. And the piece is called, What Happened to Amy? Um, I made these s drawings over a six month period of time, um, knowing that in the end, they all had to rest in the supposed space of a single afternoon.
By standing um, in the position of the observed, I'm allowing the position of the observer and the observed to be flexible, meaning I, Amy, am not locked into a particular identity as a photographer nor as a subject. I can come and go as I choose. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, the five canvases on view downstairs um, are based on uh, gay porn video box covers shot by photographer Jeff Burton. This video starred Chase Hunter, and the video was called The Chase is On. <laughs> um, this piece is called Jeff Burton Box Covers. And uh, Jeff and I collaborated on this project um, in the sense that he gave me his consent to draw these photographs. Um, by giving me his consent, it's as though through the drawing of the pictures, I'm invited onto the set, a place I as a girl would otherwise not likely find myself in. In other words, here I am a gay man. Anyway, this is Steve Rambo. <laughs> Um, I worked a lot with found images, so the fact that Jeff gave me his consent made this um, a unique position for me to stand in. Um, and the drawings downstairs are pastel drawings on canvas, and they're very fragile, so please don't touch them. <laughs> much as you may want to. I imagine the stage um, these boys stand on is rather fleeting as well. The same is true for this piece, which is a detail from a work entitled Different Girls. Um, I chose a handful of girls that occupied a similar place in popular culture over the period of one year. And that would be also a fragile position that would shift um, and these were based on 12 found images from different contexts, from videos and television, magazines, and music, and sports. And I called the piece different girls, as I didn't have their consent to name them. So again, by my drawing them, an intermediate space is created where it becomes unclear who exactly is watching and who is the performer. Um, thank you. One of the things that I would like to uh, reframe um, under this uh, particular encounter is that it is said in the introduction to this uh, show that I am the father of hacktivism. Uh, that is completely wrong. The mothers and fathers of hacktivism are a multitude, and it is a multitude that indeed has names, networks, and singularities. Um, and I would like to touch base on a couple of those. Uh, among the first names of uh, hacktivism, electronic civil disobedience, is Critical Art Ensemble, of which I was a member of uh, in the uh, mid-80s through mid-90s. It was with them that we developed electronic civil disobedience theory and practice. Long before there was uh, computers, we had uh, stolen the words of Thoreau of 1848 on civil disobedience and just cut and paste electronic in front of that and that created uh, a whole wave of conceptual work. <laughs> Following that was an encounter with Blast Five, uh, another member who's not here, Jordan Crandall. Uh, I've never worked alone, so that is important to know. Another uh, founding uh, mother and father of uh, hacktivism is The Thing, Thing.net, started by uh, Wolfgang Stela, conceptual artist and uh, internet pioneer. We started in 1991 and have a total of uh, six nodes throughout the world. Uh, the Zapatistas are certainly the mothers and fathers of uh, contemporary hacktivism. Uh, and there is fakeshop.com, a group of simulation uh, in uh, Williamsburg, um, uh, in uh, New York, that I worked with. And then there's the Electronic Disturbance Theater, uh, the 
mother and father of electronic civil disobedience and practice, uh, of which one of the members is also here, uh, Brett Stahlbaum, who will be presenting later. So I just wanted to clarify that I am not the father of hacktivism. It is a multitude. And this multitude, um, I am known as the godfather of <laughs> hacktivism. So it's a very different thing. Uh, one of the pieces that I'll present is a self-portrait. Uh, I haven't seen this piece, and neither has my collaborator, uh, Caleb Waldorf. Uh, it's basically a map of everything uh, and every group and every artist and artivist and hacktivist and media lab and hackers and digital zapatistas that I've worked with around the world. Uh, I always collaborate, and this is a self-portrait that is a map. Uh, it's being put up even as we speak, so I don't know. Uh, hopefully Caleb won't faint. Caleb is an artist in MFA here. And there is an ugly kind of little picture of a very beautiful large-scale uh, reproduction uh, that we'll see. I started work originally with Critical Art Ensemble in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, one of my uh, areas of investigation was what I call micro gestures uh, within exit culture. And uh, I would uh, set up uh, mimes at the edges of entrances of Mall, Disney World, um, Burger Kings, and I would play the soundtrack from Weekend by Godard when everybody's crashing and honking. And I would just start playing with my toys and people would gather around and they would start saying, well, this is a Vietnam vet. Uh, a, a lost individual, all sorts of things, and usually the police would arrive in a few minutes and try to arrest me, and there would usually be a dialogue between the community as to whether they should take me away or not. Uh, I would never say anything. And I always enjoyed the idea of micro gestures, uh, small uh, gestures that disturb uh, the social space and create uh, a dialogue a la Theater of the Oppressed of Augusto Boal. Uh, some of the collaborative trajectories uh, of which I have uh, interface with are electronic civil disobedience, digital zapatismo or digital zapatistas, uh, the Italian net strikes, uh, anonymous digital coalition of Italy, certainly one of the mothers and fathers of uh, electronic civil disobedience, electronic disturbance theater, uh, Floodnet, the virtual sit-in tool developed by uh, net artist Brett Stahlbaum that we'll hear a bit later, and Carmen Karasik, the first automated virtual sit-in tool. This created the ability of uh, a mass nonviolent direct action online of the unbearable weight of data bodies and real bodies saying ya basta to uh, neoconservatism and neoliberalism as, as it expanded under uh, the free trade movement of globalization. Uh, we did actions against the Mexican government of Cedillo, of Fox, against the Pentagon, against uh, uh, European companies that wanted to buy uh, the rights to uranium um, in Chiapas. And um, we even had some strange uh, informatic wars with the Pentagon. And we were later asked by the NSA to come and do a performance for them. Uh, an interesting space. Uh, some of the elements that came out of this was artivism, digitally incorrect actions, and certainly we would fall into that. And we'd also work with hacktivists or digitally correct action like Cult of the Dead Cow uh, and Chaos Computer Club in, uh, in Germany. So those are just some of the kind of collaborative trajectories that you can pop into the work. Uh, one of the most important is Mayan uh, technologies. It really annoyed uh, the NSA that so much of the work that we had done was based on Mayan technologies. And by the end of the performance, they kept saying, uh, you know, what the hell is Mayan technologies? Uh, they still don't know to this day, but this young woman that I'm speaking to uh, does know. Uh, so, and this was at the Tate uh, in London uh, a couple of years ago for a series of performances called Live. Uh, this is a, a book that will never be published, I think, and they'll be available for you there at the gallery called Hacktivism, Network Ar Activism. Uh, there are the founding members, Carmen Karasik, Brett Stahlbaum, Stefan Ray, uh, myself. These are some of the reviews we got. Uh, if the electronic disturbance data wasn't illegal, it was certainly immoral, U.S. Defense Department. Uh, the most striking thing about the electronic disturbance theater is its potential as an unheard of writing machine. It's literally dispatches from the future. That's from Style Magazine. 
Uh, we get the best things. Uh, here is a, uh, the copy of the book that you'll get is uh, my editing along with Atsuko Mi uh, Miyawaki. Uh, it follows along Ibsen's road of uh, closet drama like Brand and Pierre Gint. This is a closet book, if you will, uh, never meant to be published, uh, I think. Uh, another piece that we will see here is um, partly commissioned by Insight this past year, turistafronterizo.net, that you can play online. And uh, you'll also see an unauthorized installation uh, that was put up at the Zapatista headquarters in Tijuana, Mexico, um, uh, which uh, I signed a paper that said I would not create any material installation for Insight. Uh, only an immaterial, uh, but I, I don't like just immateriality. And the basic core idea was that the computer in the installation game box would remain there at the media lab of the Zapatista headquarters. Uh, the piece that you see uh, when you go in, uh, that will be shown at um, uh, Colectivo Feminista down in Tijuana, and then that computer will stay with the Colectivo Feminista. Uh, the game and installation uh, was in collaboration with Coco Fusco and artist uh, Arvin Orkney, uh, Tristan Schoen, and Rob Cohen. Um, Tristan and Rob are uh, students here. Uh, this is some uh, photographs uh, there. The last piece is a uh, work that I recently did, an improvisation uh, that we'll see briefly with Adrian Jenick. It was for uh, Specflick or Speculative Distributed Cinema. Uh, it's actually made to be presented on an iPod video, part of a new distribution mode. So the bit that you'll see here uh, is not um, uh, the best uh, way to do it but uh, you'll see it when you go in. Uh, basically, uh, the character is uh, an individual who has signed the contract for five years to be inside uh, UCSD's new R&D towers in 2030. He's a nano janitor. He cleans artificial matter rooms and the nano systems and material fabrication labs. Uh, and everything is streamed constantly in the state. And uh, basically, La Jolla has been destroyed by green goo. And now the university is in Tijuana. And so um, this is, you'll see a little bit of, of this. Hijo, mano, que hermoso. Man, look at those. Que? Oh, ese vato, no, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think, I think all the protocols are, are fine. I think I, I've done the Oz map and it's good, I'm telling you. No, I, I, I want you to tell uh, them that the, the THX protocol is, is clear. See, see, just tell them, just, just sideload them, eh? <laughs> yeah, Vato, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 I know. You're new and I've been hard on you all night. I say, Vato, I'm sorry, it's just, you know, I remember, like, uh, 2012, you know, when the whole thing, when she flower, you know, when, yeah, you know, the green goo, it just, it just, man, turned everything to pudding up into La Jolla, you know, there was nothing, green mush, verde, nada, you know. Hijo, man, I, <laughs> I was so fucking scared, that's, that's why, I, you know, it was hard on you tonight, because, you know, you gotta have these protocols right, and, you know, you gotta keep things clean, and, well, it's, fun, it's really an amazing privilege to to have carved this sort of a, a small space in, within the visual arts department. Uh, for somebody, uh, in this case, I would consider a kind of architect or urbanist in exile coming here to be part of this amazing family of very strange people. Um, <laughs> in, in, I'm really... Uh, uh, really excited about being part of your community. Uh, in reality, it's interesting that uh, after decades of being absent from the main institutions of uh, knowledge, you could say, of representation and display, uh, we are all uh, sort of uh, drawn back to the city, uh, yearning to recuperate it again as a possible site of experimentation. Uh, in a way, I think that uh, uh, that might be a, a part of a kind of collective sort of energy at this moment in our cultural institutions to really critique uh, so far the way the city has been understood, in a sense, uh, as a static repository of buildings, in a way, 
uh, and really, in a way, try to find it as a more complex uh, condition and, and really understanding its multiple realities, it, its multiple forces. So in a way, that has been very interesting to me in redefining my practice primarily at a juncture like this between Tijuana and San Diego, a kind of geography of conflict. And that's, uh, in fact, what uh, inspired uh, many of these images that you will see in the show. Uh, uh, today, uh, a few years ago at Southern California Institute of Architecture, where I used to teach, I brought uh, uh, dozens of uh, students of architecture from all over the continent, from Latin America, to come and understand uh, the sort of uh, condition of a double city at that time, LA, LA, Latin America, Los Angeles, and in so doing, really understand the dynamics and the conditions of Southern California in relationship to Tijuana. So students uh, came from all over the place uh, to document the, the kind of drama of these spaces, this leftover. So of marginal spaces, of pieces of infrastructure, and of, of course the kind of impact of immigration in the, the transformation of the physical aspect of cities like Los Angeles. Um, uh, these images are in fact made of pieces, many pieces of Los Angeles, San Diego, and Tijuana. In a way, they became emblematic uh, of a conversation we are trying to generate uh, to look at the city as, again, a, a kind of uh, more complex sort of force field whose thickness we were trying to really penetrate and understand. And to uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, extract the possibility, let's say, of architecture being uh, uh, more than just an object that is, again, statically uh, uh, set in a pedestal, which is a city. So uh, uh, the redefinition of our own practices, when we really uh, enter the problematics of policies, of uh, uh, the, the, uh, politi the politics of development, the economics of development, begins to, to be fundamental in our time, mainly when all of us have been very distant from the politics of making, again, uh, our environment. So how, uh, as an architect, how I, I thought, how, do, uh, uh, how uh, does one uh, operate uh, straddling back and forth between these two uh, uh, conditions at this juncture, again, between the strategies of the informal in Tijuana and the politics of zoning, let's say, of density in San Diego? Um, uh, of course, it would imply a kind of uh, entering or encroaching into an urbanism that uh, wanted to go beyond the property line and, and maybe begin to critique in a certain way uh, this environment. So uh, I began to be inspired very much by the transformation of uh, our own city in the last decades uh, by non-conforming uh, 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 patterns of use, by non-conforming densities that have completely uh, really uh, transformed what was at one point after the war a very one-dimensional levy town type of uh, environment. Uh, what is the implication of this transformation for a lot of us as architects or practitioners within the city? It has been of a lot of inspiration. I've been working with nonprofit organizations in San Diego, particularly one in San Isidro called Casa Familiar, and we figured that we could not really talk about uh, housing, for example, affordable housing, uh, without talking about uh, uh, policies, the policies that were shaping that housing. Uh, so no advances in design uh, or housing design could happen without advances in policy. So we crafted this uh, sort of micro policy with Casa Familiar, where we proposed to the city of San Diego that the NGO in this very small community would uh, end up becoming a facilitator of permits, a facilitator of micro loans, uh, to uh, also research the conditions of these non-conforming patterns of use and density, these illegal uses. Uh, one project that you will see in the exhibition engages this possibility now having this micro policy as a foundation for a particular housing project and looks at a very small uh, uh, parcel, a very small lot, and tries to understand the kind of illegal at times non-conforming uh, circulation patterns and micro economies that occur in these abandoned alleys and these communities and, uh, and, and transforms this parcel into a kind of framework of multiple ways of using the space uh, uh, so that at times it becomes a market or the NGO uh, uh, officiates sort of workshops with the community or the the whole site can be leased for a Swiss 16, let's say, party. But this notion that the, the whole site becomes a really uh, a, a used, a, a kind of a, the notions of promiscuity, let's say, of space and program has been very important for a lot of these communities. So the project ended up being a layered condition of housing and the accommodation or the, the framing of these micro economies, let's say. The idea was that we were wanted to challenge 
the very official zoning that in that particular uh, parcel only would allow us to make three or to do three uh, units of housing. We propose to this project 12 units of housing, a community garden, a renova the renovation of a community uh, or, or a historic church into a community center, uh, and uh, offices for the nonprofit. So the idea that a, a kind of social uh, sustainability would be the basis for a lot of these housing projects. That we needed to see housing as more than just an amount of units in a, in a, city, in a city like San Diego, but housing in relationship, let's say, to other things. So this condition of pairing ambiguity and open-endedness in terms of these micro-infrastructures, let's say, that could accommodate non-conforming uses and the specificity, of course, of housing really became the essence uh, of the project. So infrastructures of ambiguity is what has, uh, has been really compelling to notice in a city like Tijuana. No other place in the world we find some of the wealthiest, again, subdivisions uh, in, in, in the United States, barely 20 minutes away from some of the most precarious and poorest settlements in Latin America. So noticing the strategies of invasions of invasion in Tijuana and the idea that we could also encroach into, the, into this uh, politics of the informal has been very compelling. So we propose, or we have been proposing uh, through this nonprofit uh, that I've been working with uh, in collaboration with some uh, uh, entities in Tijuana to produce a very minimal, again, maybe following what Ricardo was talking about in terms of the kind of micro gesture, this micro infrastructure that could serve or could be, could be produced by a maquiladora with a very low technology, let's say, in Tijuana, and could serve as an intelligent hinge that that could thread many of the precarious and the kind of improvisational strategies that people use to build their environments in Tijuana by borrowing, by actually utilizing the waste of San Diego. Uh, so this became a kind of temporal scaffold that through time mediates these conditions without obliterating them uh, by allowing a, in a certain way to give a certain visual coherence but primarily a structural solidity. And this ultimately became an issue, as you can notice, between San Diego and Tijuana, between uh, bringing a bit of, let's say, chaos and, and, and multiplicity or kind of uh, uh, conditions of mixed use and density into our very one-dimensional environment in, in San Diego, but in Tijuana is the other way around. Chaos is already a fundamental part of that uh, sort of environment and that kind of sense of promiscuity it, uh, for us in Tijuana was the idea of how do we begin to kind of create a, a set of organizational strategies for so, some of those environments in terms of infrastructure. But this project, this next project, this is the last one, mediated across those two conditions uh, by creating a, a possibility of this house to move from one city to another and actually appropriating a parking lot in San Diego. This is a pavilion for uh, Insight, uh, the last Insight, uh, last last year, uh, occupying one of the most sacred parking lots of the city, you know, in Balboa Park, temporarily, and in so doing, uh, opening up, the the, again, the potentiality uh, of uh, the appropriation, again, of the leftover. Uh, and, and the idea that public space in this case could be portable, what could really take advantage of the, uh, some of the most expected, let's say, conditions. Uh, the house that you, could, that you see there uh, was planned or proposed to be transferred from San Diego to Tijuana at the end of the event uh, uh, to, again, enter or continue to really operate across these sort of flows of relationship between the two cities. Um, uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to play you a little bit of video from one of the three works that we'll be screening in the gallery as part of this show. Um, and this is called LAX and will be the premiere of a new work by the Bureau of Investor Technology. The three works that I've chosen to show in this exhibition represent um, a span of 11 years of production involved in producing work as the Bureau of Inverse Technology. These are um, the production of information products that uh, service the information age, or so was the post-colon non-explanation that followed its incorporation, the incorporation of the Bureau of Inverse Technology in 1991 when it was corporate, incorporated in the Cayman Islands. Um, the Bureau of Inverse Technology was a bureaucratic front that reproduced the anonymity of technology. Technology, of course, is a strange cultural object that scripts our collective action and certainly is collectively produced, but for which no one is actually accountable. Right? The diffusion of accountability is 
the strange and particular condition of the information age. And although there are names and personalities, you can't actually call somebody up and say, look, I really don't like the speller that's in my Microsoft Word things. You, who do you blame? Who do you hold responsible? Right. <clears throat> it's, um, you can't pin it on anyone. So when the Bureau was formed, there were many collectives, right? They're very different to the collectives or the collective practices that preceded it. In the 70s, they were concerned with the reification of singular authorship, particularly male heroes, and were concerned to reveal the collective practices and forms of production of thought and actions and, and work. The corporate art of the 90s, as we call it, the various forms of collective practices from Etoy to Artie Mark to the Barbie Liberation Organization, to name just some of the organizations and, um, for whom this particular institution and this particular department was critical in fostering and supporting. These corporate art organizations uh, were variously concerned with avoiding accountability, right? Reproducing that diffuse um, diffuse uh, condition of the information age. So corporate art has now changed again very differently and you'll see that mapped out in the um, production, uh, the three video productions in the gallery. I'd like to say a couple of words about um, all three of them and um, uh, the first of which, of course, was um, uh, produced in 1995, the Suicide Box, which was a motion detection video system placed in the vicinity of the Golden Gate Bridge. It monitored the Golden Gate Bridge for vertical motion, and when uh, there was any vertical events, it captured that to a permanent video uh, record. Now, in doing that, um, of course, we collected the... Um, suicides off the Golden Gate Bridge and also forged a new form of corporate sponsorship which we've called inverse sponsorship. That is the technological equipment used, the silicon graphics machines and the software, the custom software, we were allowed to use on the, on the um, condition that we did not mention the name of the corporations involved. This is um, one example of the strange set of conditions that you enter in producing this work. That work in, in 1995, 1997 was included in a show called The Whitney Biennale and uh, as an anonymous bureaucratic piece, the curators put it in without talking to the artists. And I think it had a particular, um, a particularly interesting um, interpretive moment there because, because it was art. The curators talked about the images of suicides off the Golden Gate Bridge as simulated footage of suicides off the Golden Gate Bridge. How they had decided it was simulated, because it was art, it was not real, it couldn't be true. The relationship between art and truth was called into question by who would produce that? Who, what bureaucratic organization would actually do that? So um, then the, the, uh, the bit plane that um, is screened was launched five years later, which, had, um, which was footage that was filmed again from a twinky little 32 inch wingspan radio controlled airplane that flew over the Silicon Valley. Also examined a, a different condition. In flying over the famed Silicon Valley, it really revealed nothing, right? Although there are no camera zones and the bit plane flew through these no camera zones, it showed the banality of a metastasizing suburban um, corporate context of what is now the Silicon Valley as it transformed from a military and agricultural uh, urban layout, but there was nothing to see. And in all the corporate contexts, all the information research contexts where you can't enter with a camera, the idea splayed out by the, the, bureau, uh, the bit plane is that, in fact, 
information is property. It can be owned. And if you go in there with a camera, you can steal it, right? which is why, of course, it's illegal too. And I think that this is a very problematic um, understanding, a very popular delusion that information is a commodity that can be owned and exchanged, and that university contexts such as this, which depend on open sharing regimes of information, um, can and does play a critical role in rethinking what our technological future looks like. The final piece, the video, is this piece, LAX, which is part of a series of projects that document the civil liberties infringements that have gone on in the name of anti-terrorism. In this case, it was a two-hour ordeal involving 18 police, 15 United Airlines staff, and uh, various other um, service workers because of the national emergency of wearing rollerblades in Grand Central Station. This, I mean, sorry, not in Grand Central Station, in LAX. Um, and examines the sort of use of this extreme force for these slightly unusual behaviors, many of which are documented in a collection called the, uh, and a web database called the Anti-Terror Line. Um, so I think just in conclusion, as I, um, as I try to cover this arc, this change of corporate art practice of collective, the collective work to produce uh, complex technical artifacts that we call our technical culture with which we recognize our contemporary times has many important political questions. New interactive technologies present opportunities for social change. This visual arts department has played a critical role in fostering practices with strong political and conceptual rigor and playful engagement with the technical future. The capacity and influence of this department is unprecedented in, within a research university and any other university in this country, um, thanks to past and to current leadership. It's an honor to be included in this department and there is no doubt in my mind that this is the most intellectually exciting art department in the US. But it's also a tremendous challenge to continue this tradition. Thank you. OK, the project I'm going to talk about tonight is the Rush Creek Wilderness Trail, which uh, was recently completed um, December 27th and 28th. Uh, the URL is available there. Um, what it is is you know, it's possibly the world's first computationally derived unofficial public wilderness trail. Um, and it was discovered by a computer algorithm that I authored called a virtual hiker. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the history of virtual hikers, uh, when talking about C5 shortly. Um, and in this case, there's no really, there's no trail per se that's been constructed. It's, it's a backcountry track that you can follow with the assistance of a GPS device or a global positioning device, like the one I'm wearing on my, my wrist. Um, the technique is that the, the track log is computationally produced by uh, the C5 Landscape Database API, which is a software project that I've been working on for the past couple of years. And the process is, is that once this track log has been produced, uh, you take a data cable, something like this, and plug it into the computer and plug that into the GPS device and upload that data uh, to the GPS device, which allows me to go into the actual landscape and follow the computationally derived path um, in, in place. So where is the trail located? It's located in northeastern California. It runs from US uh, 395 north of Litchfield uh, to near the Nevada border. Um, and that's the, the process that I just referred to, uploading the data to your GPS device and using the GPS device to follow it. The history of virtual hikers is that, again, it's a feature of the C5 Landscape Database API. C5 Corporation is a large collaboration that I've been involved with since the, the middle 1990s. 
a large number of artists working on a variety of different projects. I'll talk about the C5 Landscape Initiative shortly. Um, but it, some of the sort of key themes or concerns for C5 Corporation is exploring the virtual real axis, um, and in our case, using geographic information uh, systems. Um, in fact, the C5 Landscape Database is a geographic information system that uh, we produce sort of in a homespun way uh, within our own uh, collaboration. Uh, so that, that's one concern. Another concern is large data sets. One of the things that we discovered early on in working with uh, the particular data sets that we're working with from the United States Geological Survey um, is that we wanted to be able to explore really, really large geographic areas, in this case, the entire state of California. So this gave us um, somewhere in the range of uh, 200, or 320 million data points in a raster to process. So immediately we ran up against the problem of you know, how to actually do the kind of data processing to search this data set that we had the desire to search uh, with sort of desktop and workstation class computational machinery. Um, so the, the problem of large data sets has actually been soothed to a, a great deal uh, via uh, support of my research here at UCSD by the San Diego Supercomputing Center who have been helping us solve some of those problems. Um, and then the art historical trajectory in which I would situate this work is in the history of walking works. I, I just brought a few examples unfairly to the people that I'm leaving out, of course. Uh, Richard Long, A Line Made by Walking, 1967. Um, Richard Long is an artist who you know, travels places, re temporarily rearranges the environment to photograph it, and then returns the, the environment to its natural state or allows it to return to, to its natural state by itself. Uh, Dominique Mezioud, um, you know, The Great Cleansing of the Rio Grande River, an eco-feminist piece which is uh, very well known where essentially the, the context of the artwork and the artist as a walker was to walk um, the, the bed of the Rio Grande River and clean it up. So this brings me to the C5 Landscape Initiative projects. And I'm only going to talk about one project in the C5 Landscape Initiative due to time constraints, but it's actually a, a suite of projects uh, that, that have been ex exhibited recent, most recently at San Francisco Camera Work. Um, I'm going to talk about the Other Path project. So, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is this is the project that instigated research into virtual hikers. Um, the, the original concept was to, um, which was sort of C one of C5's obsessions for about a two-year period, was to find the Great Wall of California, or in other words, the Great Wall of China, where it should be located in California if it was moved, in the most topographically similar locations. Um, so the data set that we're using, uh, the digital elevation model data set, um, was uh, processed through the C5 Landscape Database API in order to discover where in California the, the Great Wall of China should go. The process is my colleague, who is also the, the project leader in this case, uh, Jerry Wittig, who's an MFA from the Cadre Digital Media Lab, um, w traveled to China to hike iconic sections of the Great Wall of China in order to collect, a, with the GPS device, a, a representative sample of that landscape. Uh, we brought that data back, inferred the topographical conditions in those areas, and then did the database search to find the locations in California where those locations of the Great Wall should go through our, our own software. Um, so the virtual hikers come in and uh, as part of the project, um, you know, pattern matching search procedures, uh, where we found the locations in California that were most similar to the locations in China where the Great Wall of China was, and then we traveled to those locations as C5. You can see in this image uh, the other Mutenyu, I'm not pronouncing that correctly at all, um, but that's the location of that, this particular iconic section whoops, of the Great Wall. And where, so on the left side you see um, you know, this iconic section of the Great Wall of China. On the right side you see the location in California where that iconic section of the Great Wall should go. And uh, part of the process is then for C5 to travel to those loca locations and follow the path of the Great Wall. So in a sense it's performance uh, through walking dictated by um, computation and uh, again playing with ideas of the the virtual and the real and the intersection of the virtual in really quite a literal way with the real to produce walking works and 
you know, so the, the real work in this case, I, mean, I think the, the, you know, if you're gonna identify an art object in this case, it's the hike itself. That's the experience that you have in the landscape uh, with the GPS device on following the path. Um, nevertheless, as artists, you know, there's a responsibility to sort of create um, you know, ways to uh, describe this to the public through multiple interfaces. Uh, this is from uh, the exhibition for this piece, which is two large etched glass panels with uh, the topography of uh, California and China uh, embedded in the glass through a laser etching process uh, with projections on them. And the projections demonstrated in this case both uh, the algorithm, the process of the algorithm, um, you know, snips from uh, the actual um, um, adventures in each of these locations and um, a, a demonstration of uh, some, other, some other information was presented in there, uh, projected onto these two glass panels for the gallery installation. So um, these are some highlights then of the Rush Creek uh, Trail. Um, this is Stony Creek. Um, and so again, to sort of reiterate, what happened in this case was uh, an algorithm discovered a path that was followed through the landscape. And I show this image simply because the virtual hiker found a path along the top of this canyon rim here. Um, and instead of descending into the canyon, it, it actually found a way along the top of the canyon that was relatively easy to hike. Uh, here's the trailhead, which was very much arbitrarily selected by myself. This is on a basaltic volcanic lava flow. Um, so this is where the trail begins. Uh, this, and basically what you're gonna see in the gallery tonight is an interpretive sign that um, you know, simulates the sort of semiotics of the typical kind of wilderness trailhead sign that you would see that it also has these highlights on it. So uh, you can read the descriptions of that. Uh, I'll just cover a couple of the highlights. This is a small intermittent waterfall near the rim of the canyon uh, that the virtual hiker decided to walk past and that I, following the virtual hiker, had the pleasure of seeing. Um, this is the mouth of Stony Creek. The, in this, the Rush Creek Wilderness Trail rises up out of the Stony Creek um, drainage and up over uh, this watershed. So this is the area, just a photograph from the spot, where you can look in both directions. You can look back towards Stony Creek and you can look ahead toward the Rush Creek drainage uh, where the virtual hiker is leading you. Um, this was a really interesting artifact of the algorithm. So what, part of what's documented in the trail map that you'll see up in the gallery are not only kind of interesting spots along the trail that I, I, you know, I took the liberty of naming, but also interesting areas along the trail where artifacts of the algorithm produced something that I thought was interesting. In this case, um, whereas it would have been easier for the virtual hiker to go around this particular hill, for some reason it chose to go up over the hill. And it yielded um, this, it's, you know, I'm not making any claims about intentionality of the software, but it was, it was nice. It yielded sort of a nice view of this uh, unnamed draw that on, was on the other side of the hill that drains into the Rush Creek Canyon. Um, this was another uh, computational artifact, and I'll, I will wrap up. Uh, this is another computational artifact, which were switchbacks. Uh, that actually weren't necessary uh, to follow as switchbacks that eventually led into um, the Rush Creek Spring area. So this is phase one. Uh, phase two of the trail will be, com will be open to the public just as soon as I've hiked it. And um, I'll, for now, what you, if you would like to go and hike this trail, all you need to do is download the tracks and spend about $500 at REI on proper equipment, and, and then you're good to go hike the uh, Rush Creek Wilderness Trail. Thank you.